And we're currently in the study of uh, Romans. Last time we finished up at the 11th verse of chapter 6, so we'll start with the 12th verse of chapter 6 uh, this week. Before we do, though, let's have a short word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we pray that the bless our study of thy word. We're grateful for the, the record that has been left for us, for the direction that we uh, derive from it, and for the hope that it gives us. May we ever be faithful to the precepts and the uh, commands that are contained therein. Therefore, we may prepare ourselves to be meet for our master's service. In his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> It reads uh, in verse 12, uh, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Now sin is a, is a tyrant and its uh, sphere of influence is the mortal body. But it rules or reigns through the appetites of the flesh uh, that control it and lead it into sin. And of course, we read in, in 1 John 2, 16, it talks there about the uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. But it, uh, it uh, leads into sin only as the desires of the person lets it uh, lead it into sin. So it's always subject to the will of the person. And the objects of uh, temptation, they act upon one's desires. They have no other uh, avenue in, on which, in which to work. And they, uh, of course, desires seek to be gratified. So the will, well, what controls or should control the, one's desires, it's the will that yields to the temptation in order to gratify the desires and the result is sin. Therefore, we are not to obey the desires of the mortal body. In verse 13, and, and do not present, uh, Greek is present or yield, uh, King James Version uses yield, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present, and that's the uh, Greek aorist tense, and King James again uses yield, do not present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So that's how we're to present ourselves, and not to instruments of unrighteousness, but to uh, as being alive to God. So every uh, faculty and power of the human body with which we either commit sin or work righteousness is included in the term members. To present them or yield them is, is to tender them for use in the service of another. In the present uh, case, it's either presented to unrighteousness or presented to God. If we can use them as instruments of unrighteousness, we can also use them as instruments of righteousness. But there's no third option. It's either one or, one or the other. The Romans uh, had been among the spiritually dead, but had been baptized in the Christ, at least the Romans that this letter is addressed to. And in that act, uh, they had been buried with him to, to rise in newness of life. As Paul wrote in Colossians, the second chapter, verse 12, it says, buried with him in baptism, in which you also are raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead, raised Jesus from the dead. Verse 14 says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. 
So sin shall not rule over you such that you will use your members in its service. Uh, if it uh, has not dominion over you, it, it cannot procure your final condemnation. Uh, this is not to say that one does not sin, uh, but since we are under a system of grace rather than a pure law system, there is forgiveness by humble obedience to the will of our Lord. Verse 15 says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Uh, certainly not, or God forbid. So uh, what are the conclusions that we are to draw from what has been said? Uh, sin is just a transgression of law. But we're under a system of grace rather than law. So how is it possible that we can sin? We must then be under some sort of law system. We are not under a law system that condemns sins but makes no provision for pardoning it. We are under a law system that condemns sin but makes provision for pardoning it. Now that is God's grace uh, provided in the gospel. To the question as to whether we may sin because the gospel of grace provides for its forgiveness, he answers, uh, Paul does, with a resounding no, a very emphatic no. Uh, to do so is a willful, willful abuse of the grace provided by the gospel. In such a case, God's grace is withheld. Verse 16, it says, do you not know that to whom you present you, as King James used it, to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Now, the, the Greek uh, root word for righteousness may also mean just or justification. So we may use that term sometimes. It is uh, universally conceded that a slave will obey its masters or serve the consequences if he doesn't. So to determine the uh, master, you, know, you just need to observe whom the, sl the slave serves. So if one serves sin, that is, habitually practices sin, then sin is the master. On the other hand, if one renders obedience to the gospel, to the Savior Jesus Christ and to God, then he is their slave or bondservant. God and others uh, is the master to whom obedience is given and the other is Jesus Christ. And death, as used here, is uh, used in contradistinction to righteousness or justification. This then is spiritual death as opposed to physical death because of the sin of Adam, not ours. And that's uh, how, we, how physical death uh, entered the world. In verse 17, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. <clears throat> I might say that the uh, God be thanked that though, though is not in the Greek, and uh, King James doesn't have it, and the ASB inserts, whereas, however, though and whereas are implied. So the translators inserted it. It makes for an easier reading, I suppose. It says that though you are slaves of sin yet, and uh, King James says, but yet you obeyed from that heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. <clears throat> they formerly served sin, therefore they were slaves to it. <clears throat> 
they obeyed from the heart. And then that requires that the mind, the will, and the affections all enter into the service. So they obeyed from the heart and used all those things to enter into that service. A mere outward performance without the involvement of the heart, heart is not obedience. And there must be a desire to obey God. The one leading motive and desire that is essential to all service that we render our God to God is the desire to obey him as Lord of heaven and earth. We can desire to obey him only as we believe and trust him. <clears throat> Obedience to the gospel is doing things that gets us into Christ, which include belief in God and Jesus, repentance of our sins, confessing Jesus as the Son of God, and burial with him in baptism. Then Jesus Christ becomes our new master. We are taken from one master, that of sin, and delivered to another, that of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel that delivers us from sin, our former master, to our new master, Jesus Christ. And it's that form of doctrine to which we were delivered by our obedient to it from the heart. In the 18th verse of chapter 6, <clears throat> it reads, And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Being set uh, free from sin and the rule of sin by the form of teaching into which they were delivered by being buried with Christ in baptism and raised again in newness of life, they had become bond servants or slaves. Bond servant is a slave. They had become bond servants of uh, righteousness. <clears throat> Verse uh, 19, he says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness, and that's uh, uncleanness is impurity, uh, personal sins, impure thoughts, and unchaste conduct. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, uh, that's uh, lawlessness is omissions of duty or it's a proactive transgression leading to more lawlessness. That uh, includes both classes, uncleanness and lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves of, uh, of righteousness for holiness. He spoke in terms that were familiar to the Romans. Otherwise, they may have uh, misunderstood him. There are many years in heathenism had rendered them weak in the flesh, unable to understand spiritual matters presented in a different manner, that is, on a spiritual level. Before they rendered obedience to the gospel, they served uncleanness and lawlessness. One unclean and or unlawless deed led to another. Sin or breeds sin. Before they, they used all their powers of mind and body to commit sin. Now they are to use the same in doing right that they may be holy. In verse uh, 20, <clears throat> it says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Again, this is an allusion to the uh, slave master principle. When they were unbelievers and serving sin, they had no obligation to righteousness, uh, or at least they felt no obligation to do righteousness. They recognized the option to be true again on the slave master principle. Verse 21, what fr fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. When they were slaves of sin, they were free as to righteousness. What benefit did they derive from the, uh, those sins then committed? Well, they didn't 
derive any benefit from them, none. When the Romans looked back over their past lives, they were ashamed of the sins in which they formerly delighted. Their current shame indicates how sincere their repentance had been. Since those sins would lead to death, it made no sense for them to return to them regardless of the grace extended to them. <clears throat> In verse 22, but now having been set free from sin and, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and that's uh, sanctification in, in the ASV. You have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. It is if a former master had set them free. To be free from sin is to be forgiven. And the worst bondage possible is to be a slave to sin. By transition from a slave uh, to sin to a slave of God, they have produced the fruit of holiness. The fruit in verse uh, 22 is fruit received rather than fruit produced. They have their fruit in the holy lives they live. In, a, in a, a opposition to their former life, Paul says, you are now living in holiness, and the end to which you may rightly hope is everlasting life. <clears throat> in verse uh, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, our Lord. Uh, when one gets on the payroll of sin, sin always pay. Never miss payday there. The sinner does not have to bargain for his wages. Uh, he is sure to receive it. And it is the same pay scale for all job holders, regardless of skill level, uh, level or seniority. For one more, the payment is never late, nor the funds insufficient. The specie of payment is the same for every wage earner, the eternal separation from God, spiritual death. Eternal life, however, is a gift. It's not wages paid for a service. This gift is bestowed on us in Christ, through him and by him. The blood he shed on our behalf has enabled the Father to bestow it on us, not as something we merit. Christ made provision for it, and in him we shall realize it. Beginning uh, chapter 7, <clears throat> or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? Whether uh, Paul is speaking to Jewish Christians or to Gentile Christians, uh, the message is the same. He is speaking to people who knew the law of Moses, the Jews intimately, and the Gentiles because the Old Testament scriptures were quoted so often. And both knew something about how law worked, that people were, were subject to it, as long as they lived, but were released from it upon death. Some say that this is not necessarily talking about the old law, but law in general. Uh, they reason that a specific law, in this case the law of Moses, only had dominion over the Jews, but it was not for their entire lives because it had been abrogated. Point being made is that man is subject to some law as long as he lives. To the Jew, this would be the law of Moses. Now, the corollary is that death releases one from the dominion of law, any law, but the law of Moses in, in particular. Uh, and the Romans would have understood the logic of this argument. In verse 2, it says, For the woman who has a husband 
is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So the, the Jews and their obligations to the law are compared to the woman married to the husband. Well, and, you know, it's just as true if, if it was talk about the uh, man being married to a wife, same situation holds true. According to the, the marriage vows, both are bound to each other as long as they shall live barring infidelity. If the husband were to die first, then the woman is released from the marriage law that bound her to her husband. And you might, uh, the reason also would be a correct one, by his death, he's released from the marriage laws of binding him to his wife. For there will be no marriage or giving a marriage in the spiritual realm. This principle uh, being acknowledged, Paul moves on to the next verse to further elaborate on the marriage analogy, which leads to its application to believers in uh, verse 4. Um, following verse 3. <laughs> so then, verse 3, if while, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she would be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. So if the wife marries another man while her uh, husband under the law is alive, she would be a, an adulteress and subject to severe penalties under the law of Moses. Likewise, if a Jew is subject to the law of Moses, served according to another law, that is, uh, for example, uh, an idol, he would be guilty of spiritual adultery and, and subject to, to uh, severe penalties. The same law that binds the wife to the husband, as long as he live, lives, sets her free from the sub, uh, subjection as, long as, he as soon as he dies. She is free then to marry another. The Jews were bound to the law of Moses as long as the law was in force. But since the law was taken out of the way, they were released from their obligation to it and were free to become united with Christ. <clears throat> Whether they died to the law or the law died, uh, they were no longer bound to it. Another principle elucidated here is that one cannot be married to two laws at the same time. In verse four, therefore, my brethren, you also have come dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So the therefore leads to a conclusion from the general principles of law covered in verses one through three. The old man was uh, crucified with him, put to death, Romans 6, verse 6. The new man that arises from the water river baptism is free to be united with Christ. If the Jew died to the old law, then it was no sin, uh, spiritual adultery, if you will, to be married to another new law. In the illustration, the woman is freed from the law of the dead husband and is free to marry another, then becoming subject to the law of the new spouse. Christians had uh, died to the old law <clears throat> and is cursed by the death of the uh, Christ and being no longer subject to the old law were now brought under a new law the law of Christ that is the gospel they now owe their fidelity to this new law fruit born to God by, are the acts of obedience to him under the new relationship In verse 5, it says, For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. <clears throat> While we were in the 
flesh, uh, we were subject to its uh, propensities, inclinations, and desires. Uh, sinful passions are desires uh, which, if, if indulged in, leads one down to the path of sin. And when gratified, it causes sin. This is the state of all men, Jew and Gentile, before obeying Christ. These uh, sinful passions worked in our members. And since sin must be punished, a law system would condemn the sinner to death. Not only did these passions work in our members while we were in the flesh, that is, uh, before we became Christians, to a certain extent, they still work in our members, else we should be without sin. The difference between our former state in the flesh and our newness of life in the gospel is, is that previously these desires ruled us. Now we rule them. Our members are blind. They have no brain or will of themselves. But they're not blindly led. We can truthfully say that uh, Satan uses them. And uh, when he does, our passions become slaves to sin. <clears throat> and he will always be at your right hand to assist you in, in uh, yielding to your passions. But uh, exactly how is it that these sinful passions or uh, King James Version uses motions of law, how were they aroused by the law? Uh, were these passions excited or set in motion by the law of God, which, which is holy, even the law of Moses was holy? If that is so, the complicity of the law in causing sin is ineluctable, can't be gotten over. The answer would be that the law does not produce the sinful passions, but that law identifies and reveals those passions, the manifestations of which are sinful. Law allows those sinful desires to be discovered. In verse 7, uh, we'll get to it uh, shortly. In verse 7, Paul says that he would not have known covetousness unless the law had forbidden it. Covetousness, covetousness existed before any law was given, but law, as with any law provision, declared it to be sinful or made it known to be sinful. The codification of law forbidding or compelling certain practices made abundantly obvious the sinfulness of certain acts of commission or omission, as the case may be. It is our inner spirit, guided by the gospel, that must control these passions. And Paul will now show us how this must be done. Verse 6, it says, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve, and we, we could uh, insert God right here because it's certainly implied. So we could say, so, so that we should serve God in the newness of the spirit. Uh, it's, it's simply lowercase spirit in the King James Version and not in the wholeness of the letter. Uh, we were held in the law as in the power of the master, and were so held until we died in the person of Christ when he died on the cross. By that death, we were re released from the law and so passed under grace where we now stand. Not only did we die to the law, we also died to sin, so that sin no more dominates the faithful Christian than does the law. When Christ was crucified and raised from the dead, our old man was crucified with him and raised from the watery grave of baptism to walk in newness of life. 
as we read in uh, Colossians, the second chapter, verses 11 through 15, it reads there, in him you also, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So we are dead to the law, dead to sin, and although still in the flesh, not controlled by it. As the New King James translated, translates it, we should serve God in the newness of the uppercase spirit. So whether it is the Holy Spirit or man's spirit, is determined by the context for the Greek word uh, is the same in both cases. <clears throat> Here, spirit and law are being compared. Certainly, the gospel is the sword of the spirit, and we are to serve God as his spirit has directed us by the gospel. But it is probably that Paul is referring to the spirit of man as in John, the fourth chapter, verses 23 through 24. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worship, worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> so I think probably the uh, King James is a, is a better rendering of the, the uh, Greek. Uh, not to be ignored or lightly dismissed as a part that man has in securing his own salvation. In Jeremiah, the 31st verse, verse 34, we read, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, in their sin, I will remember no more. Now, a great many denominational commentators thought that the principle of men teaching other men the truth about God was here nullified by this verse in Jeremiah. Uh, but this cannot be since God himself ordained that, quote unquote, they shall all be taught of God, John 6, chapter 6, verse 45. And the Great Commission itself commanded that they shall teach all nations. Uh, George uh, Dehoff gave the, uh, I think, the true explanation when he wrote, uh, quote, under the new covenant of Christ, men are taught before they become Christians. Then they must obey the gospel. Under the old covenant, a child was a Jew as soon as he was born. And he had to be taught this fact when he was old enough to understand. The significance of this passage is very great. It means that no untaught person can be a Christian. Hence, no infants in the true sense are Christians. You must be born again, Jesus said. And all infants have been born only once. Infant membership allows many unregenerated people to grow up in various uh, denominational churches without regard either to their faith or obedience, opening the gate for many outright unbelievers to gain and exercise power in some so-called Christian communions. Another tremendous uh, truth, uh, Brother Dioff goes on to say, uh, sometimes imported into the doctrine of, of the New Covenant is that the gospel cannot be a formal code guaranteeing certain blessings to those who obey it. 
because it begins with an offer of unconditional pardon. And it is in the sense of this full unmerited love, which so affects the heart as to make obedience henceforth an inner necessity. <clears throat> if the gospel, he goes on, is not something which men must obey, why did Paul declare that, quote unquote, the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God? and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians, the first chapter, not a part of verse seven and, and all of verse eight. If the human heart is so irresistibly impressed by unmerited unconditional forgiveness that it will automatically obey God, why are there so many backsliding Christians? goes on to say, uh, furthermore, no verse in the Bible even hints that God's salvation is unconditional. Uh, did not Jesus Christ say, he that believes and is baptized will be saved, Mark 16, verse 16. And even there, uh, baptism is by uh, no means the only condition, for it stands as a synecdoche for the full catalog of Christian obligations. If salvation is unconditional, God alone is responsible for the loss of salvation of every man who ever lived. But again, Paul declared, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 10. Let God be true and every man a liar. So it is the case that man's spirit is actively involved in his salvation. Uh, note also that uh, God, quote unquote, remembers no more the sins that are forgiven, an achievement that sinners themselves cannot accomplish. And we'll have more to say uh, later on about uh, this uh, idea that. Uh, unconditional salvation. In verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law of sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. So in the view of the foregoing, uh, what shall we say? Is the law the cause of sin? This has reference to the sinful, quote unquote, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law of verse 5. What was said there could be said here. If these sinful passions were aroused uh, by the law, then the law, either directly or indirectly, was in some way responsible for uh, such. These sinful Passions existed for uh, the law, any law. The desire to eat of the forbidden fruit was there before God said, You shall not eat. The commandment made it clear that eating of the forbidden fruit was sinful, but it did not create the passion to eat it, it was already there. The specification of an action as sinful is not the same as causing the sinful action. As the apostle Peter wrote in quoting God, and said in, uh, he said in first uh, Peter, first chapter, verses 15 through 16, uh, but as he called you, he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Sin and holiness uh, are opposites. To be holy is to be sinless, or, or at least not a habitual practice, practitioner of sin. Man would never have known what sin is or have any knowledge respecting it if law had not identified it. Now, this is what Paul is saying. If God kept silent regarding what is sin, 
never having communicated with man upon it, which he did in the form of law defining what things are sin, the conception of sin would have never have occurred to the human mind. Since God wants us to be holy as he is holy, he wants us to have this nature. <clears throat> now, commandments are designed to specify God's nature, that is, what it is to be holy. That is the reason, ultimately, for the gospel, which allowed man to be holy for he is holy. The example given is uh, with respect to covetousness. Now, there was covetousness in the heart of man before the commandment, you shall not covet, was given. So the law did not uh, create covetousness, nor did it promote it. On the contrary, it had identified it. It specified it to be sinful. It condemned it. And it prescribed his punishment. When Paul says, I would not have known, he is speaking of man in general, including himself. Verse 8, but sin, taking the opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the, the law, sin was dead. So seer, uh, sin is here personified as acting uh, uh, of human nature. Paul makes clear that the law is not sin, nor does cause those passions which induce it. It is sin or the personification of it that produces all manner of evil desire. Sin, however, is not a living thing. So who then is the active agent co-opting our nature to produce sin? It must be a real being, not merely a result of an action. Well, it is Satan who tempts us to sin. He is the one that takes advantage of our human nature to work up an evil desire, but he must be provided an advantage. That advantage is a law. Satan never approached Eve until the commandment was given. He then used the commandment as the opportunity to deceive her and cause her to sin. Apart from that commandment, there was no possibility for Satan to deceive her. There was no sin in eating of the forbidden fruit, except the commandment said no. Said, uh, no. Prior to the commandment, Sin was not only dead, it didn't exist. <clears throat> in verse uh, 9, I was alive, uh, that is in the sense of being without sin. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Paul is uh, stating a hypothetical since there's never been a time beginning with the commandment not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that man has been without law. Without law, there was no sin, nor could there be, be any condemnation for sin. <clears throat> if there was no condemnation, there was nothing to cause death in any sense. Therefore, Paul, as a stand-in for mankind, says that he was alive before the law was given. But when the commandment came, sin revived and he died. The example he gave was that of covetousness. Before the law against covetousness was given, there was no sin in coveting, therefore no condemnation. Of course, a commandment that's used here is any commandment from God, including unwritten commandments, uh, commandments codified as the law of Moses or the gospel of Christ. One, of course, uh, must never forget the role of Satan in all of this. Now, keep in mind that Satan only appeared to Eve after the commandment was given, not before. In verse 10 of chapter 7, and the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. Uh, the commandment or law was not sinful. 
uh, when obeyed, it delivers life. But it was abused and violated. So the very thing that was to bring life, if obeyed, brought death when violated. <clears throat> for sin, taken uh, in verse 11, for sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me and it killed me. <clears throat> so the commandment did not uh, deceive, but provided the occasion or, or opportunity for the deception to take place. Again, the example of Adam and Eve illustrates if Satan is substituted for sin, then Satan used to his advantage the commandment not to eat the forbidden fruit. He said to Eve, you shall not die. The commandment afforded the advantage, but it was the lie that did the deceiving. Paul was not dead or killed at the time of this epistle. So the killing had to be prospected. Physical death, if talking about the sin of Adam and Eve, or spiritual death, or more accurately, the, the second death, because the spirit never dies, uh, if talking about unforgiven personal sins. In verse 12, and this will be the last verse we uh, do for the night, Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Uh, verse 7 asks the question, is the law sin? So a reply is made in, in the next four verses. The old law is holy since it comes from God. Again, using the example of you shall not covet. It is holy because it comes from the very nature of God and is therefore pure and without the slightest taint or implication of sin. It is just and that is right. Uh, it's right in its requirements of man and it is free from wrong. It is good in that it is positively beneficial to the welfare of mankind. So we'll begin with uh, verse 13 next week. Thank you for your attention.